Coronary artery disease can lead to myocardial ischemia, which is when the myocardium isn't getting a sufficient blood supply, so there isn't enough oxygen to meet the heart's demands. And coronary artery disease is characterized by a type of chest pain called angina pectoris, which can be due to either vasospastic disease or atherosclerotic disease. Vasospastic disease, also called Prinz metal angina, is when, for unclear reasons, there's transient vasoconstriction of a coronary artery, leading to transient ischemia. These attacks generally happen at rest, during the night or early morning, and happen in clusters. Atherosclerotic disease is when a coronary artery narrows due to buildup of atherosclerotic plaque, and it can be further divided into stable angina, unstable angina, and myocardial infarction. Unstable angina and myocardial infarction are collectively called acute coronary syndrome. Patients with stable angina don't feel pain at rest, but they do feel chest pain during intense physical exercise, because that's when the myocardium has increased oxygen demand, which leads to transient or demand ischemia. The chest pain stops when the exercise stops, so these patients often just rest rather than going to the emergency department or ED. Now, angina is considered unstable if it presents at rest, or if it becomes more frequent, lasts longer, or happens with less exertion than previous episodes of angina. In unstable angina, there's prolonged myocardial ischemia, but there's no myocardial cell death yet, so it's not a myocardial infarction. But if it's not taken care of promptly, the ischemia can get prolonged and can lead to myocardial infarction, which is life-threatening. When a patient comes into the ED with acute chest pain, a number of things have to be done within 10 minutes to confirm or exclude a myocardial ischemia. The differential diagnosis includes gastroesophageal reflux, pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, a pneumonia, or a panic attack. The first step is to check the airway, breathing, and circulation, perform a quick physical exam, and attach cardiac and oxygen saturation monitors. And supplemental oxygen should be given if the oxygen level dips below 90%. And supplemental assisted ventilation should be given if the oxygen level dips below 80%. Emergency resuscitation equipment should be nearby, including a defibrillator and airway equipment, just in case the patient goes into cardiac arrest. All patients with suspected myocardial ischemia should be given 325 mg of aspirin, unless there's a contraindication, like a history of an anaphylactic reaction or if they've already received it. The aspirin can be given orally or as a rectal suppository. In the meantime, IV access should be obtained and blood should be drawn for initial laboratory work, including a CBC, electrolytes, creatinine and blood urea nitrogen, coagulation factors, lipids, and most importantly, cardiac biomarkers of acute myocardial damage, including a troponin T and I, which are essential for diagnosing a myocardial infarction. Other cardiac biomarkers like creatine kinase or lactate dehydrogenase are less sensitive and specific than cardiac troponin, so the current guidelines recommend cardiac troponin as the only cardiac biomarker that should be measured in a patient with suspected myocardial infarction. Troponins are generally found inside cardiomyocytes, so when they die, the biomarkers are released into the bloodstream, so their blood levels rise. But it can take up to 6 hours for the elevation of cardiac biomarkers to be detectable, so troponin levels should be checked initially and then again after 6 hours. If troponins are negative, it might be that the patient is having unstable angina, a short attack of Prinz metal angina, or a non-cardiac cause of chest pain. If troponins are positive, that means there's cardiomyocyte death, which means that it's a myocardial infarction. Next, it's important to get a clear history of the chest pain, and the acronym OPQRST can help. O stands for onset, which is usually sudden and at rest but might also happen while exercising. P stands for provocation, so which activities provoke pain, and palliation, so which activities alleviate pain. Generally speaking, angina pectoris doesn't improve or worsen with respiration or position. Q stands for quality, which might be described as a pressure, heaviness, tightness, fullness, or squeezing. R stands for radiation, which is most often to the neck, jaw, and left arm. S stands for sight, which typically is substernal or in the left chest, 
and the pain is usually diffuse and difficult to localize. If a person can point to the site of pain with a single finger, it's less likely due to cardiac ischemia. Finally, T stands for time course, which typically lasts over 30 minutes. Myocardial ischemia can also cause dyspnea, palpitations, nausea, and increased sweating. And some important risk factors include being over 55 years old, being male, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes mellitus, smoking, obesity, and family history of first-degree relatives with premature coronary artery disease. So males before the age of 55 years and females before the age of 65. Also, women, older adults, and patients with diabetes often have atypical presentations, like just dyspnea, epigastric pain or discomfort, syncope, or sudden death from cardiac arrest. In individuals having myocardial ischemia, so those with unstable angina and myocardial infarction, as well as Prinz metal angina, nitrates should be used immediately to help widen the coronary arteries and help increase blood flow to the heart, which should relieve the pain and decrease the blood pressure. Three sublingual doses of 0.4 milligrams of nitrates are generally given, one every five minutes. If the patient has Prinz metal angina, nitrates will lead to an immediate and full recovery, so nitrates help with both diagnosis and management. And if the patient has unstable angina or a myocardial infarction, then pain and blood pressure should improve. So if there's really no improvement at all, then intravenous nitrates might be needed. Nitrates are contraindicated in cases of hypotension, myocardial infarction of the right ventricle, and recent use of PDE5 inhibitors, like sildenafil, because in these situations, nitrates can cause really severe hypotension. Additionally, some patients with ongoing chest pain or tachycardia should be given beta blockers to lessen cardiac demand. And if the patient is hypertensive, intravenous beta blockers can be used. Beta blockers are contraindicated in Prinz metal angina because they can worsen the coronary vasoconstriction. They're also contraindicated in bradycardia, cardiogenic shock, and acute decompensated heart failure, all of which can worsen with beta blockers. Beta blockers are also contraindicated in cocaine-related acute coronary syndrome. That's because cocaine triggers a huge release of sympathomimetic amines. And if the beta receptors are blocked by the beta blockers, then those sympathomimetic amines end up binding to alpha receptors, causing severe coronary vasoconstriction. Now, patients with underlying heart failure must be given an intravenous loop diuretic like furosemide. In addition, patients with severe and persistent chest pain can be given intravenous morphine sulfate at an initial dose of 2 to 4 milligrams, repeated in 5 to 15 minute intervals. Basically, every patient suspected of having myocardial ischemia should get a standard 12 lead electrocardiogram, or ECG, within 10 minutes of arrival to an ED. And the initial ECG is often not diagnostic. So it should be repeated at 5 to 10 minute intervals if there is high suspicion for myocardial ischemia. In addition to making sure that there's a normal sinus rhythm, if we suspect myocardial ischemia, the most important thing is to check the ST segment. In healthy individuals, the normal ST segment has a slight upward concavity. In stable angina, the ST segment is normal. And in unstable angina, the ST segment is generally normal or depressed. Now, myocardial infarctions can be divided into non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, or NSTEMI, and ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, or STEMI. In an NSTEMI, the ST segment might be normal, but there might be an ST depression that's more than 0.5 millimeters or 0.05 millivolts in two or more contiguous leads, or deep T-wave inversions above 1 millimeter or 0.1 millivolts. STEMI is when there's an ST elevation above 1 mm or 0.1 mV in two or more contiguous leads or new left bundle branch block. ST elevation happens when there's full thickness involvement of the myocardium. The location of a myocardial infarction can be determined by which ECG leads show ST elevation. In anterior wall ischemia, ST elevation will show up in the precordial leads, so V1 to V6. In enteroseptal ischemia, it'll show up in leads V1 to V3. 
Apical or lateral ischemia will show up in leads AVL and 1, and leads V4 to V6. Inferior wall ischemia will show up in leads 2, 3, and AVF. Right ventricular ischemia will show up in the right-sided precordial leads, which can be obtained by placing leads V1 to V6 in a mirror image position on the right side of the chest. And posterior wall ischemia will show in the septal precordial leads, so V1 and V2, and posterior precordial leads. Now, ST depression in V1 and V2 is also important because these anterior leads mirror the ST elevation that might be happening in the posterior precordial leads V7, V8, and V9, which are not included in the standard 12-lead ECG. In other words, they represent a posterior STEMI, which needs to be treated as a STEMI and not like an end STEMI. Now, Prinz metal angina might present with a normal or depressed ST segment in short attacks, or ST elevation in long attacks. However, the ECG changes can only be found during the attack, so to spot it, the patient should be put on Holter monitoring, which is a device that records ECG tracings for 24 hours or longer. Now, if there's no evidence of ischemia, you should do further testing in the ED setting, such as a stress test, which measures the heart's ability to respond to external stress in a controlled clinical environment. The stress response is induced by exercise or by drug stimulation with dobutamine, Cardiac stress tests compares the coronary circulation while the patient is at rest with the coronary circulation during physical exertion. A negative stress test means that the coronary arteries are able to dilate and provide more blood to the myocardium when needed, and that the chest pain is likely from a non-cardiac cause. A positive stress test means that the coronary arteries aren't able to dilate, and that the chest pain is likely due to unstable angina, which is managed the same way as an end STEMI. So a patient with unstable angina or NSTEMI needs urgent treatment with antithrombotic therapy. Both oral antiplatelet therapy with a P2Y12 inhibitor like clopidogrel, in addition to aspirin, and anticoagulant therapy with heparin to prevent thrombosis or embolism from an ulcerated plaque. After that, individuals at high risk of short-term adverse events should be identified. Those are ones with hemodynamic instability or cardiogenic shock left ventricular dysfunction or heart failure, recurrent or persistent rest angina despite intensive medical therapy, new or worsening mitral regurgitation, new ventricular septal defect, or sustained ventricular arrhythmias. These high-risk patients should get immediate coronary angiography, as well as revascularization, which is also called reperfusion therapy, to restore coronary perfusion. Low-risk patients should get coronary angiography, and reperfusion therapy within 12 hours of symptoms. Patients who lack these features should undergo early risk stratification to identify individuals at high risk of long-term adverse events, who therefore should be treated with an early invasive strategy as well. Two common scoring systems are the TIMI risk score and the GRACE score. The TIMI score considers seven factors, each accounting for one point in the final score. Age over 65, at least three risk factors for coronary artery disease, prior coronary artery stenosis of 50% or more, ST depression, at least two anginal events in the prior 24 hours, elevated serum cardiac biomarkers, and use of aspirin in the prior seven days. The GRACE score considers eight factors, age, systolic blood pressure, heart rate, ST segment deviation, so either elevation or depression, cardiac arrest at admission, serum creatinine concentration, serum cardiac biomarkers, and Killip class. The highest total possible score is 363. Now, the Killip classification takes into account physical examination findings like rails or crackles in the lungs, an S3 heart sound, elevated jugular venous pressure, acute pulmonary edema, cardiogenic shock or hypotension, oliguria, cyanosis, or sweating, as well as the development of heart failure. Patients at high risk using the GRACE risk scores are usually referred for coronary angiography and reperfusion therapy. Specifically, if their GRACE score is higher than 140, they're referred for early therapy, so within 24 hours from diagnosis. And if their GRACE score is between 109 and 140, 
they're referred for delayed therapy, so within 72 hours from diagnosis. Lower risk patients might get non-invasive testing like a stress test to determine their need for coronary angiography and reperfusion therapy. Moving on, patients with STEMI need immediate, so within two hours from diagnosis, coronary angiography and reperfusion therapy, ideally within 12 hours from symptom onset. The two ways to do reperfusion therapy are mechanical reperfusion with primary percutaneous coronary intervention, or PCI, which usually includes the insertion of a stent to keep vessels open and is strongly preferred. The alternative approach is to do reperfusion therapy using medications, sometimes called pharmacological reperfusion, using fibrinolytics. Typically, that's done when primary PCI can't be done within two hours of arrival to the ED. If more than 12 hours have passed since symptom onset, reperfusion should generally not be performed but emergent PCI might be done for patients with ongoing ischemia or those at high risk of death. After reperfusion therapy, or in cases where it wasn't done, oral antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor plus anticoagulant therapy with heparin is given to patients. All right, as a quick recap. Coronary artery disease can be due to either vasospastic disease, so Prinz metal angina, or atherosclerotic disease, so stable angina, unstable angina, and myocardial infarction, which is further divided into n STEMI and STEMI. Patients presenting to the ED with suspected myocardial ischemia should be given aspirin, nitrates, morphine, get troponin sent, and get an ECG looking for ST segment changes, all within 10 minutes. In Prinz metal angina, there is immediate and full recovery with nitrates. If the ST segment is normal or depressed and troponins are negative, it's unstable angina. If the ST segment is normal or depressed and troponins are positive, it's NSTEMI. If the ST segment is elevated, it's a STEMI. So you don't need to wait for the results of the troponins, but they'd definitely be elevated. Unstable angina and NSTEMI are managed with a combination of antiplatelet and anticoagulation therapies and a risk factor assessment is done to decide if they need immediate coronary angiography and reperfusion therapy. STEMI is managed with emergency reperfusion therapy, either with PCI or systemic thrombolysis. And after reperfusion therapy, patients are given a combination of antiplatelet and anticoagulation therapies, 